Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, this is James Kandasamy. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate you. I know I provide a lot of value through this podcast and I want you to share it with your friends, with your families and anybody else that you know that kind of benefit from listening to this kind of content. Go share it through Facebook, into LinkedIn, through Twitter, through Instagram or any other channels that you want to share it because sharing is caring. Thank you. Let's go on with the show. Hey, audience and listeners, this is James Kandasamy from Achieve Wealth Through Value at Real Estate Investing podcast. Uh, I know we have been talking a lot about, you know, multifamily or apartment investing. And I'm sure we have talked about uh, mobile home park self-storage and we've talked about industrial. Today, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, single tenant net lease, you know, on the retail side of it. And I have uh, Jason Ricks. Who's, uh, who's also a local Austinite. Hey, Jason, you want to say hi to everyone? Yeah. Hey, James, good to see you. And especially outside of our CCIM classroom and, and testing facilities. How are <laughs> yeah. you doing, buddy? Good, good, good. Very good, very good, very good. So uh, Jason has been doing a lot of uh, new stuff in this space, and I really want to bring him on because uh, single tenant net lease is actually a lot of it. If you look around, if you drive around, you'll see a lot of single tenant net lease. I think I, pre- I presume... Walgreens, CVS, right? A single tenant, yeah, right? Absolutely, you got o- it. AutoZone, everybody single tenant. There's a lot of people making money out of it as well. There's a lot of investors. All these are investors. Yeah. On it, but who is investing on it, right? Because I don't bring that. I don't specialize in that deal. I don't really find a lot of syndicators or sponsors who are raising money to invest in that. So, so we're gonna go very deep into this asset class, and I want to really see, uh, you know, how it can be very attractive because. As I talked in my book, I mean, you know, I know some people say apartment is the greatest investment asset class, but for me, it's simple, right? It's every asset class goes in cycle, goes up and down, and you have to find Absolutely. the best operator in that asset class to make a really exceptional return or really make a good uh, operation. Yeah, and you can be lucky just because the demand is there. There's a black swan effect on certain asset class, uh, but no, uh, you know, I, all asset class are open for investment, right? So. Jason, why not you tell about yourself and we can go deep dive into the uh, single tenant uh, net lease uh, asset class. Yeah, sure. I'll do a real quick, quick uh, shameless plug for James's book. For, for those of you <laughs> who, are, who are limited partners, I haven't talked to James about this, but for those of you who are limited partners and are interested in learning about um, you know, syndication and investing, James, you, you nailed it. Um, congratulations. I know creating a book is extremely time consuming and tough, yeah. but uh, great work. Um, I started my career as a broker at the perfect time. So 2008, I was a, I was a really a retail and office broker and really tough time, but a great time to kind of learn and cut your teeth. Uh, I worked for a whole bunch of different ownerships. Each owner had different strategies. You know, I worked for ground up developers. I worked for folks that were just simply looking for cash flow and wanted to keep expenses really low. So um, worked on different asset types, industrial, office, and retail, but predominantly retail. Did that for about four years and ultimately wanted to transition more into the asset management field business, get a greater perspective. And uh, it was trial by fire. I took a job in Dallas, worked for a self-made billionaire, and he had a really, really large portfolio uh, in Dallas and in Oklahoma. And the guy was a tyrant. But he, he, he threw me in to this office setting and said, basically, OK, Jason, here's a staff. Here's a portfolio increase in OI. We're heavy, heavy, deep value add. And so, um, you know, we were working on all different types of fun asset classes. We were doing ground up development. We were taking old office buildings, tearing those down and building single tenant buildings. Um, we worked on a Radio Shack portfolio that was under bankruptcy on the industrial side. So we gained, you know, a million square feet. Uh, subdivided that and, and leased that out. And, and one of our, I guess, claim to fames is when you used to have these Walmart centers, James, remember the old, we have the super centers now, they're, they're monsters. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But before they expanded, 
they had these regional stores. So the footprint was a little bit smaller, wasn't as advanced. We would buy a portfolio of those. And what we would do is we would cut those up into individual anchor tenants. So if you had 300,000 square feet, we'd say, okay, we're gonna lease 50,000 to Planet Fitness. We're gonna lease another 50,000 to Tractor Supply. And then we would put on the, what we call the pad on the out parcel of the land closer to the street, we would also do a small uh, single tenant at lease building. So we would try to find creative ways to add value. We did that. And uh, as any good asset manager will tell you, um, a lot of your comp and bonus is, is predominantly on the fact of you increasing an OI. And once you increase an OI, they're usually going to sell the properties or refinance out. At that point, I needed to make a decision, um, transferred over and started working for a private REIT, um, very large institutional owner, and ran their retail department at that time. Um, ultimately got to a place in my career where it was ready for me to go to my own. And we looked at syndicating um, shopping centers. That was primarily our focus, but something happened, James. Around 2016, you saw the competition of online sales eating away at what I would call prototypical retail, right? So when that started to happen, there were a lot of headwinds on how to underwrite shopping centers. And so when we were evaluating these deals, we got to a place where we couldn't comfortably confirm these numbers. We do these detailed Argus reports and things like that. But, you know, some of these shopping centers, they'd have key anchor tenants. That would be half of your NOI. Well, I mean, that's a big gamble on one tenant, right? It's not like your multifamily stuff where you've got 300 units and 300 tenants right. where if you lose one, you're not in trouble. So we decided to find something, especially in this low yield bond market. We wanted to go after, uh, you know, basically a core, what we call a core plus fund. So low volatility, very stable, something that would compete with corporate bonds um, and, and give investors a nice stability, uh, kind of a bedrock foundational piece within their portfolio. And that's, that's what led us to the fund that we've created. And so we have a basket of buildings in our fund I think you touched on it earlier. I think everyone probably has seen a single tenant net lease building when they're driving to and from work or picking up the kids or, or what have you. But uh, these are standalone occupied buildings occupied by one tenant. Um, and, and these are usually on kind of the main intersections or thoroughfares. So they've got great visibility. People can see them. Um, they're on hard corners. And, you know, we use this phrase, these leases are, are basically bond leases, James. These are... Mm -hmm investment grade tenants, right? So Exxon Mobil, Starbucks, um, CVS, they pay fixed rents and they are responsible for the triple nets, which we'll get into here in a second, which is very yeah. different from the multifamily side. And so they act like bonds uh, from that perspective. Yeah, so yeah, we're gonna go deep into it. I know you, you went a bit more than what I wanna cover in the first question, but that's okay. We will we will, <laughs> we will piecemeal it a bit because I don't know. I'm sure a lot of my listeners have a short attention span like me, right? So, sure. so, um, so let's define single tenant, right? Versus multi-tenant. And do you focus just on the retail side of it? Uh, I do. Yes. Okay. Just on the retail side. So let's, mm -hmm. let's explain what is a retail asset class. Sure. One of the examples of it. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with the one that we're bringing up right now, which is a single tenant net lease property. That's a mm -hmm. standalone building with one tenant occupant. Okay, what is a net lease? So a net lease, great. So um, it's short for triple net. Okay. And what so that triple means, net and triple net and net lease is the same thing, I guess, right? Yeah, the way we use it in abbreviation. Sorry, I use this slang all day long when I'm talking <laughs> to folks. So that's okay. That's uh, okay. But when we say net lease, we're we're talking about a true triple net lease, and that's where okay. the tenant's responsible for paying the taxes, insurance, and the maintenance on the building, okay. which is very different from, let's say, like your your business for the apartment mm -hmm. side, right? So I'm not getting okay. phone calls in the middle of the night to change toilets or air conditioning units. Hmm. the um, the deals that we own, the tenants are responsible for that maintenance. Yeah. So the triple net is basically taxes, insurance, and maintenance is all paid by the resident, by the, by the tenants. We don't have residents in, in this case, right? So tenants, yeah. right? So, so let's say, for example, I buy a building and I put a Starbucks in it is in one building. The Starbucks is going to pay, you know, taxes, insurance, and maintenance, which is basically nothing else for me to pay. Right. I mean, other than building maintenance, I guess. Right. 
Absolutely. So for from a perspective, when you're underwriting these deals, James, you can kind of forecast pretty accurately your future cash flows. Yeah, correct. Because usually the leases that uh, the landlord gives to like Starbucks in that case, they have a predetermined um, rent increases like, like 2.5 or 3% or 4% or what, right? So yeah, so, the, so they'll increase either annually, James, or what we're seeing very common from the top users is they increase every five years. Mm -hmm. So they may jump, you know, seven to 10% every five years. So what kind of cap rate, let's say if I want to, today I'm going, I'm a newbie in this business, right? If I want to go yeah. and buy a, a building to or put a put a tenant on it, what kind of cap rate as a landlord I can expect on buying a, a property like this? I mean, today is, is, you know, I know we're in COVID right now, right? But pre-COVID, right? Let's assume pre-COVID, what would you be able, what kind of cap rate would you be able to get? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the most desirable, uh, the most credit worthy tenants are usually going to get the lowest cap rate, just like in okay. your space. So they'll cap rates start at the very bottom at three and a half percent. And these are for like, you know, again, your, your best tenants, the best land, best markets. Um, however, there's a big discrepancy. So today you and I could go buy really good credit tenants uh, at a five and a half to even a seven cap. So that's interesting. So it's not like I set the market rate anybody can come and rent. It basically depends on the tenant coming in. It depends on their credit and how strong they are. Absolutely. They can determine the price of the rent. Well, that's, uh, I never really thought think about, about it. it. Here's the way I think it. Think about it like bonds, right? So like if the U.S. government issues a 10-year note right now, the treasury bill, mm -hmm. you know, that's at 1.6% today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, a junk bond is going to be closer to 4%. So the further you go out on the cap rate, the more perceived risk there is involved in that. In the Got economy. it. Got it. That's very... Mm. I mean, I, I never really thought about it, but I know there's, there's different credit expectation of the tenant. So for example, Starbucks would get a really good cap rate. I would really get yeah, really good Starbucks, price. Because... Probably around, depending on the market, they're anywhere from four to 5%. Okay, four to 5%, cap, which is pretty good, right? I mean, it's similar yeah. to apartment cap rate, right? So, so why aren't people buying more uh, triple net buildings? versus buying apartments, or maybe I'm the only one who doesn't know the answer. Yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, this is a common, this is a common question I get. Uh, ironically, it's the highest trading market. Mm. Uh, and the reason why is there's so many of these properties at lower price points, James. So like, you know, I can, you, you go buy a $20 million apartment deal and I can go buy 15 single tenant at lease buildings, right? Okay. So, okay. so there's a lot of transactions and uh, I don't want to get too granular, but because of the 1031 exchange, People can jump in these and then defer oh. capital gains and jump into another one. So they're, they're heavily traded. Got it. It's a smaller chunks of commercial real estate where you want some people just buy it for themselves rather than going into a syndication where it's a larger investment. Okay, got it, got it. I mean, apartment do have a good appreciation factor just because of so much things happening in the, demo, in the demographic space, right? So that's the added juice on it. But Absolutely. if you look at pure cash flow, I think probably it's the same, I guess, right? Buying a a small single tenant net lease versus buying, a, I mean, investing into an apartment is probably is the same, but but you are right. I mean, somebody who want to do 1031, they can jump into this small single tenant uh, net lease because they can hold, hold the entire building, even though you can still do 1031 into a syndication, but it's more tricky. Yeah, right? so, I've, got a theory, I've got a theory, James, you know, like, you know, investing sometimes like in index, index funds can be really boring for people. And I think, you know, buying what I call, quote unquote, bonds wrapped in real estate for these single tenant buildings, they're mm. not as fun. You know, you're not going in there and juicing them up like uh, a lot yeah. of other people with heavy value ads. So yeah. it's a little bit more plain Jane. But again, <laughs> the, re the returns are, are really superior and, and yeah. I'll get into some other advantages here in a second. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So, so let's go to other advantages of, uh, you know, single tenant net lease uh, retail asset class. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the biggest one that I tell people all the time is what we talked about earlier, the, the lease structure itself. Um, you know, they're going to pay for the taxes, which they go up <laughs> historically. Insurance is going to go up. Maintenance is going to go up. All of that's passed to the tenant. So you have a very predictable set of cash flow with a high credit tenant. So that, that's a huge, huge advantage. So you can, it gives you a level of certainty that some other um, types of assets and, and multi-tenant buildings would not give you. Um, you touched on one that was, that was great earlier, James. You said, well, what's the demand for these within the investor market? Well, one, they're highly traded and they're, and they're highly coveted because of the passive nature due to the triple net lease structure. 
uh, but tenants love them. So historically, single tenant at least properties are the highest occupied asset class out of any of the commercial real estate asset classes. So we backdated this information to like, shoot, even into the 70s. And when you look at historical occupancy for, for these properties, they're like 97% across the board. So uh, apartments are right up there. They're, they're doing really good, especially in the last decade. Uh, industrial is doing really good right now. They're in high demand. But um, again, the one at the top of the board is always going to be single tenant at least. Um, the, the other advantage um, is the long-term nature of these leases. So when tenants sign these, these are usually 10 years for the initial term. And then they have renewal options, which they can extend their lease for an additional five years. Now, within the original term of the lease, there's going to be baked in fixed escalations in rent. And on the renewals, there will also have fixed baked in rental escalations, or they'll have a clause in there that says, we can renew our lease, but it will be at a fair market value, which is negotiable. So um, what we like about them, these tenants are very sticky. Uh, and I use that term as far as, you know, when they're in long term there, they They've, they've kind of established a corner. They like their location and their building. They've got great access and visibility, all of those things. It, um, you know, tenants like to stay long-term and, and, uh, and if they do leave, then we're in a position where it's going to be highly desirable by the tenants to be able to release that space. So how long is the leases usually? Usually 10 years with about two to three five-year renewal options. So they can be, usually they're going to control that land for at least 20 years, up to 30 years. Hell, I, you know, I just did a CVS deal. You'll laugh at this. They sent me a, a 75 year um, initial term with five five-year renewal options. So, <laughs> you know, that, that, makes you, that makes me feel really old when I think about, oh my, oh my Lord, like- <laughs> What am I gonna do? Five-year long lease. <laughs> like, wow, that's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone wonders right, when you drive to CVS, Walgreen, HEB. I mean, you're talking about anchor tenant, right? I mean, that's to say that one big tenant there, and everybody else is surrounding them, and they drive a lot of the NOI, right? So, how do how do people do the? I mean, how do people do that kind of investment? It's all investment property as well, right? No one person owns the whole building, right? I mean, I mean, people do own it, but it's also an investor, right? So. That's how people are doing it. And, um, and do they, what kind of loan do you get for this kind of deals? Um, well, you can, we can go to like, um, you know, insurance companies are, are offering, again, because of the credit worthiness of the underlying leases, uh, we can get really favorable terms. So right now we're, uh, we've, we've talked with a couple different uh, lenders and institutions and we're right around like three and a half percent fixed for, for a decade. And then, you know, spread over LIBOR. Will it be recost? Uh, some are and some aren't. Depends okay. depends yeah. on the lender. Okay. Okay. So basically between the life, let's say, for example, the lender is a life insurance company. They want some yield, but they don't need a lot of yield. Yeah. And you as the investor, you take the most yield, I guess. And then the tenant who really do not want to be in the real estate business, right? But they want to do their own business. They need a place and they get a long-term lease, which is very sticky to their to their business and their customer base. That's very interesting. So let's talk about the fund that you're going to be launching to do the single tenant net lease acquisition moving forward, right? And after that, we're going to talk about, you know, you guys are integrating cryptocurrency into this fund. Yeah. And that's very intriguing to me because I really want to know how is that's being done because I mean, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is so cool factor, but nobody knows how people are use, using it, right? So yeah. Let's talk about how, how it's going to be done in your fund and, you know, how in real estate in general. Yeah, no. And I, uh, I'll, I'll correct you really quick. And, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to come off as a jerk. The, a lot of people think mm -hmm. that blockchain and cryptocurrencies are kind of the same thing. I mean, they're, okay. Okay. They're one of the same branch, what our fund utilizes is the blockchain. Okay. The blockchain it's, technology, I guess. Okay. Yes. Yes. So which, which enables us and I'll get into it in a second. Uh -huh. uh, which is, enables us to pay people in different types of currencies as an option. So, um, but I'll, but I'll, I'll kind of get to that fun point here in a second. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the fund. Uh -huh. um, I partnered uh, about two and a half years ago with Michael Flight, and he's been in the space for 30 years. Um, I think we both got a little tired working for large institutions. Um, 
and a lot of JV deals that we did, you know, the larger JV equity partner controlled a lot of it. So we wanted to go out on our own. Um, and we picked a strategy where we invest in single tenant essential businesses. So not true retail stores. Um, so what we're trying to go after heavily is medical retail. We think that's a great demographic play with baby boomers. So, you know, think of like a dialysis center, like a DeVita, um, an Aspen Dental. So everyone's got to get their teeth done, surgery centers, urgent cares. We're even looking at veterinarian services. Uh, Banfield's a great one that we like because they're owned by the Mars Corporation, which has got great credit. Um, we, we really like auto services. So, you know, James, you, when you're traveling to San Antonio and back to Austin to, to view your deals, you got to get gas, man. You got to know got to change your brakes every once in a while. So these are essential. Um, so we really like that auto service category. We also like daily needs. So um, people are still going to the grocery store. They're still going to tractor supply. They're still going to the dollar store. Um, and then last, you mentioned one uh, earlier, which is um, wellness. So pharmacies, we really like drive through pharmacies, mm. not just because um, we like CVS and Walgreens, but we, the fact that you have a drive through there makes that location and land extremely desirable for any tenant that could backfill that space. Um, and so that, that summarizes kind of our, our, uh, diversification. And then we're, we're buying these properties in what we call the smile states. So we, we really closely watch net migration patterns. And I'm going to throw out a, a tacky phrase that's been that's been used a lot but retail follows rooftops so the more bodies that you have within a certain market like for example austin's growing as you know and dallas and phoenix and um, you got parts of florida that are growing like crazy tennessee nashville so we want to be in those areas where there's high growth um, and on really really good corners so we're, we're watching net migration and we're, we're picking states mostly in the southern Part of the United States where a lot of uh, states are growing, um, you know, beating New York and, and um, Illinois, states like that. Got it. Got it. So let's go into a bit more detail on how, I mean, I, I know you guys are using the blockchain technology, right? So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to go into detail on how, okay, so do you use, so, so blockchain is a technology. I mean, I roughly know what is it because I uh, used to be a network engineer and electrical engineer. So there's That's a lot right. of- I forgot I was talking to someone really smart in this space. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I know so some of it. I'm a technical I, guy I, here. Yeah, you. but <laughs> I, I, I do not know the details of it, right? I mean, I'm just trying to understand what is this Bitcoin and what's the what's the technology? I know it's a very, very powerful technology behind it, right? But I I could never imagine how that technology can be you know, used in real estate, right? So, um, I, I mean, are you guys- I know, I know you say use blockchain to for payment system, or is it just, uh, I mean, can you clarify what are you guys trying yeah. to do? Sure, I, I wanna, I'll slow this down a little bit. So I wanna, I wanna make sure I speak really clearly. Okay. Our fund will be a, a 506C mm -hmm. Reg D. So okay. just, like, just like your funds, James, right? Where right. you have accredited investors and mm -hmm. um, they put in US dollars, they get you know, distributions done. Uh, mm -hmm. Our fund is no different than that. Okay. All this is, is like a, it's like an added technology wrapper. That's the easiest way to think about it. Uh -huh. And as an investor, you can decide to, Hey, I don't want to mess with that stuff. I just want to get my monthly cash flow distributions uh -huh. and, and just sit in the fund and, and I'll be happy. Or you can opt into the technology and what that technology enables you to do are two really amazing things. And this is why we started this company to begin with. Um, it allows you as the investor to get all the benefits of private ownership, but you can trade your ownership in the fund. So you can literally, like if I, I could call you, James, let's say I had, uh, I was an investor in this fund. I could call you and say, hey, do you wanna buy a portion of my interest? Do you wanna buy the whole thing? Do you wanna buy me out? And you and I could literally trade. That's just peer to peer. Or you could put it on the secondary exchange we're gonna have multiple different secondary exchanges. All this can be done from your dashboard. And so you can literally hit the button and you can go and post it on certain exchanges and people will bid um, to own your asset. Is that so, a crypto exchange or is it just something that you guys are creating on yourself? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's not something we're creating in house. We're partnering with the, the best um, secondary exchanges. Okay. That way, our investors get the most liquidity options available. Okay. Um, but uh, no, they're just essentially trading the, the security token aspect of it. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Okay, so now I understand. So it's not really a crypto thing, I guess, right? So no, no. It's more no. of a flexibility to move around, uh, to sell and buy shares between uh, exchanges, I guess. Okay, got it, got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. And then here's the cool thing we pay monthly cash flow, right? So okay. you get a check from us. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you opt in to the new technology wrapper, Mm -hmm. You can decide if you want U.S. dollars, mm -hmm. you can decide if you want a U.S. stable coin, mm -hmm. or you can decide to take Ethereum. Mm -hmm. so you okay, can, so that's where the crypto comes in, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's just <laughs> okay. an option that you can, you can um, you know, if you, if you like cryptocurrencies, you know, we're not, you know, uh, I have a little bit invested in it, but not a lot. I love real estate. That's where, so <laughs> I probably won't even opt into the technology, but it's nice to have, right? If there's like a life event or... yeah. You know, let's say something happens, heaven forbid, with my family or wife or kid, like I need to access some quick money. It'd be nice mm -hmm. to have the ability to, to get out um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and use those funds as needed. Yeah. But why did you guys give that option to, you know, to like um, get the money in, in a cryptocurrency? So is there any benefit that you see? Or I, uh, you know, when we started this a year ago, James, uh, a lot of people were very skeptical of it. But uh -huh. that was when when uh, Bitcoin was at like uh, less than 10,000. Um, mm -hmm. Now it's over 52,000. And I think people are coming around to the idea of using crypto. Um, we also believe that the more people that buy these security tokens, the greater the liquidity overall for the marketplace. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really the driving factor, James, is when you invest into these private funds, you're basically married to that sponsor. Your money's tied up. You, you can't get it out. Um, and I think as investors get more educated on this space, they're going to realize, hey, I want to have the option to get out. Like James is a rock star when it comes to syndication for, for <laughs> multifamily. But like, let's say, I don't know, J like, let's say James, somebody, you know, doesn't want to be in San Antonio or Austin and they want to put their money somewhere else. And hey, I've got too much exposure to multifamily. Sorry, James, I'm going to get <laughs> out. You, they have the ability to do that. And I think that's just an absolute game changer. And I think it's, I, I don't make bold statements very often, but I, I think this is going to revolutionize the status quo for most syndicators over the next decade. Yeah. yeah. Well, usually in my syndication, I do allow people to, you know, in case of any, any emergency, they do able to buy and sell, but it's not a common thing and it's not an easy thing. Uh, you know, you have to do a lot of paperwork, get the attorney involved and all that, right? But I'm sure, I think the way you are describing is you basically has securitized uh, any of this investment into a small, small pieces and mm -hmm. it's just floating in some place, right? And people can hey, log in and say that this is all my pieces. Now I want to I wanna share, I want to sell some of it to somebody else. Anybody want to buy, you know, is, is that correct statement? That is correct. And that's the beauty okay. of blockchain. It's, you know, it's just a digital ledger that's mm -hmm. encrypted. And you, you've got people that are, that are making sure that it's extremely difficult to hack into. Mm -hmm. and, and all of that is locked into the blockchain. And so that enables that, that ability to transfer these units to and from different investors. Hmm. Okay. So um, I'm just trying to see, you know, because so basically you have converted the cash from investors into all the security tokens, which is invested into real estate. And that's where the blockchain comes in. I mean, blockchain is just locks, locks that token to that person, I guess, right? Because it's a highly, yeah, highly absolutely. encrypted, highly encrypted uh, token and protected, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. I mean, so it's just like everything else that you do, James. You get the the K one statement goes to the yeah. tenant, goes to the investors, and and they get to take advantage of all the interest deductions and depreciation that we have, and uh, they they can again if they want it if they want to put U S dollars in and get U S dollars out monthly, that's mm. totally fine. You don't even have to opt in, but it's just nice to have the the flexibility to do it. In my opinion, mm. yeah, it's a very interesting concept because basically you tokenize all the investment into this blockchain technology, which is which, I mean, blockchain is a, is a nice name, but it's actually basically, it's a highly encrypted personalized uh, tokens, right? By yeah. So if it's a 50,000, if I put 50,000, I have a 50,000 token and it's all floating around across different investment, I guess, right? And now you can exchange it between people. 
yeah. uh, if they want to, and and I'm sure and, and, is there, is there those, ease of ease of movement between people to people? Yeah, and and those those coins are backed by tangible assets that are paying mm. real cash flow. So it's not some you know ethereal um, you know random currency, right? It's it's yeah. literally it's backed by these brand name tenants, and it's paying monthly cash flow to you. So um, I I'm just talking out loud here, but if you're getting a six percent cash on cash with these types of credit tenants i think there's going to be an appetite for people to to want to buy that and own it when you're mm. the 10-year bonds are yielding uh, less than two percent so you're getting negative real returns yeah yeah very interesting concept so um yeah we're good the, we're <laughs> the first to do it so it's been uh, <laughs> i'd like to say that it's been an easy ride um I think anytime you're the first to try something, you're going to be the man that's going to be the most bloodiest going to the wall. But <laughs> uh, we've learned a lot and I and we're, we're just working so hard to make sure that this is so simple for people to understand. What James and I are talking about is is really high end level stuff. But at the yeah, end of the yeah. day, this is just like any other fund and you can you can opt into this technology if you want and it could maybe make your life easier, better. Um, but but again, you don't have to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I wonder when you get the K1 and uh, the IRS look at the K1, they say 10, 10 Ethereum. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> 10 Bitcoin, right? So what, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure you guys will convert it to cash and present it in K1, right? So that's Yes, what, that's correct. Yeah, yeah there'll be, yeah, a, there'll be a yeah, calculation. Yeah, I think we're, there's always... We're working, we're working with the best names in this business. So we work, um, our fund administrator is Stonegate. They mm -hmm. handle very, very large hedge funds in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with Securitize uh, as our transfer agent. We've got um, Coinbase, which is the wallet provider. So for custody, which is, I think, what was their evaluation the other day, James? It was like, it was mm -hmm. a huge, huge evaluation for the company. Um, and we have, you know, great attorneys behind us. We, we've got institutional level accounting um, mm -hmm. overseeing it. So we, we're super excited about it. And, and we love the team that we've got together. Got it, got it, got it. Well, Jason, uh, nice to have you on your show. Can you tell our audience and listeners how to get hold of you and your company and website and all that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again, James. Um, you can you can go to libertyfund.io to check out our website. We, we've got a ton of really cool videos and educational content on this. Um, we're also going to be going live with the fund next month, which we're really excited about. Um, so folks can pre-register if they're interested or just feel free to reach out to me at jason at libertyfund.io and happy to answer any questions that you guys have. We, uh, we also have uh, a podcast called Nothing But Net. This is uh, no pun intended, but it's nothing but, you know, NNN. Um, we also have a um, Chicago Blockchain Collective meetup that we host. And uh, you can see all those videos on YouTube. If you're interested in learning more about the technology side, we've got the smartest people in the space doing it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure a lot of uh, cryptocurrency geeks and you know enthusiasts are gonna be listening to this. Yeah, that's my guy, you know, he talks my language. That's right, that's <laughs> right, that's right. Well, we're real estate guys first and foremost. I, um, that, that's what really gets me excited is going out and buying these deals and, and then paying the, the, the monthly cash flow to folks. Got it, got it. Well, Jason, thanks for coming on and uh, adding value and introducing some uh, new, amazing new concepts uh, to real estate. James, always a pleasure. Look forward to uh, seeing you in person soon. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audio book. It's the audio version of his best-selling book on passive investing. You can get the audio book completely free along with other valuable resources by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.